Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Voting Rights Then and Now, a program of the Atlanta University Center, Robert W. Woodruff Library. The special theme for today's program is the Black Church, where do we go from here? My name is Clint Fluker, and I serve as the Assistant Director of Engagement and Scholarship at the AUC Woodruff Library, and I am joined today by our esteemed guest, Reverend Dr. Brandon Crowley. Thank you so much for agreeing to, to be with us today, Brandon. I'm happy to be here. So happy to be here, Clinton. It's good to see you again. We, we lived in the same dorm in undergrad. That's right. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about that during there. We'll see. Yes. Now, before we begin our conversation, I just wanted to point out that this program is part of a series of interviews with dynamic people from across the country on the subject of voting, and in particular, voting on Tuesday, November 3rd in the 2020 United States presidential election. We at the AUC Woodruff Library want to encourage everyone to vote, but we also want to inform people about the history of voting rights in this country and host discussions about the specific reasons why it is important to vote. With this in mind, for more information about the AUC Woodruff Library and our special programming related to voting rights, please visit our digital exhibit, Voice Your Vote, the history of African Americans and the right to vote curated by Tiffany Atwater of the AUC Archives Research Center at www.glam.aucTR.edu. And please continue to look for updates on future programming throughout the month of October on the library's main website, www.aucTR.edu. Now I'd like to officially introduce our guest for today. The Reverend Dr. Brandon Thomas Crowley is a scholar of religion, theology, and ecclesiology. Reverend Crowley earned a PhD in theology and society and a Master of Sacred Theology from Boston University. His dissertation entitled Inclusive Black Congregations constructed a methodology to intentionally disrupt and dismantle oppressive forms of ecclesial and theological normalcy, normalcy within black churches. Since 2009, Reverend Crowley has served as the senior pastor of a thriving predominantly African-American suburban congregation in West Newton, Massachusetts the historic Myrtle Baptist Church, and he currently serves as an instructor in ministry studies at Harvard Divinity School. Wow. All right now. <laughs> this is a very, very impressive uh, interview. I'm so excited that you're uh, willing to do this with us. And so I just have a, a bunch of questions for you. I'm going to try and keep them down because I know we could talk all day. <laughs> but uh, let's get started. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Crowley, tell us a little bit about your journey to get to the position you are in today? Um, well, I think I'll start by saying that I've always known, and Clint, you know this as well, I've always known that I wanted to be a pastor and that I wanted to work with Black churches, for Black churches, and to, uh, now I've discovered I want to write about Black churches uh, because I think there's a gap and I want to fill that gap in talking about sexuality and gender and queering in connection with Black church history, which my argument is that the history of the Black church in general is a history of queering. Queering, I'm defining that as, as, as a verb, subverting the norm, changing oppressive dynamics. Um, subversion is what Black religion and Black Christianity is all about. And so my work is dedicated towards trying to show uh, the queer theorists and the black religious community how we could work together to uh -huh. subvert all of the oppressive norms uh, in the world. But I didn't start off there. <laughs> I started off being a little boy in a black church in Rome, Georgia and watching my home church pastor, Kerry Ingram, um, just watching how he moved and operated within our black community he was more than just a Sunday morning preacher. He represented us when there was issues of police brutality. He, he represented our community in city council meetings. He, he was kind of like our little black mayor in many ways. Um, and in watching him, I was captivated by the level of respect and the work that he was doing from his heart in our small city. And, that's what made me want to be a preacher first. I just have to be honest, it wasn't anything theological. It wasn't some voice coming out of this, out of the wind. It was me seeing a, a black person 
who was doing good, not only in the black community, but he was challenging even the white community in, in the ways in which it was oppressing us as a people. And so I wanted to be connected with that. And then when I started listening to this gospel message about this Jesus, oh, I really just became just totally sold because you had this man that was going in, turning over tables, who was standing up for the rights of oppressed people. He was breaking rules and norms to bring the essence of femininity and womanhood in to the dominant conversation. He was even talking about sex. Mm -hmm. um, so I just became very captivated with this Christ. And the older I got, I was a bit naive. I thought that, 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 that everybody was really about being like Jesus, not just trying to create this monolithic way of worshiping Jesus. And I got in trouble. And that's when I figured out that um, what I had interpreted as what it meant to be a minister, what it meant to be a follower of Jesus or a Christian uh, was actually antithetical to what was actually happening in a lot of spaces. It was more so focused on personal piety and evangelical notions of salvation, uh, which is important, but when that doesn't connect with justice and, and addressing oppressive systems is, when, in my opinion, we go in the opposite direction of what Jesus was trying to do in the movement. So for me, my journey has been, my journey with this relationship with God as one who believes in a higher power and a source that is, that is within me, that, that, that I am connected to and a part of, but is also outside of me in the form of other people. It's been a rocky journey. It's been a, a very rocky journey for me. It's been, it's been a love hurt relationship with the church, with the black church. Mm. Uh, as an African-American queer man um, who um, finds my identity at the intersection of blackness, difference and hope, <laughs> I, I, am, I, I have experienced a lot of pain in this journey of being a black religious leader in the Christian tradition. Uh, but I'm reminded of my grandmother who used to tell me, she used to sing a song, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free. No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. So I think that the hurt that I have experienced as a queer person in the black church and the hurt and pain that I've experienced as a black person in dominant Christendom um, is, and I don't want to paint this trope of, of this suffering salvific savior is the way to save the world. I, I think there's some problems in that theology. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there is something very special about feeling called to put yourself out there and to, to actually be different and to push the mark. I believe that's what Jesus did. And so that's what my, my journey is. Um, I define myself as one who is trying to subvert norms. And the specific area where I've been called to do that both in my clerical ministry, but also in my academic work is in the black church in particular, trying to make her live up to her ideals in the same way that we as black people are trying to make America do the same. Thank you for that. And I, I see that uh, there's there's more to your story than just the, the ready-made preacher who came to Graves Hall. And, uh, <laughs> I didn't assume you just came out like that. <laughs> it's great to hear about your journey a little bit. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, you, you already uh, started discussing one of the questions. And so I wanted to move on to, to another because I think that the way you described your, your ministry is also very connected to your academic work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to just move straight on to what are the greatest issues facing your congregation and your students today? Like what comes up? Mm. Um, thank you for that question. And, and, and um, this just popped in my head. So I'm actually going to tweak this to say uh, issues facing black congregations, because I know that some of my congregants may look at this and I don't want them to think I'm, I'm airing out. <laughs> um, but, but, but no, I'm just joking. I, I think our church is wrestling with the things that I'm going to say as well. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's one of the reasons why I'm pushing our church so hard to rethink what it means to be church, to rethink and reimagine what it means to do church and to do black church. Um, your father talks about this in the grounds have shifted. Um, this, is, this is major work. So I think some of the greatest issues that we're facing, number one is relevance. I think black churches are facing the issue of relevance. Um, and I say this because mainline black congregationals, congregations are on the decline. A lot of us as researchers got drunk on the wine of the Pew Research Forum in 2007 when they said that only white mainline churches were declining. Um, and they've since come back and corrected that. Because in, in I think in the 1970s, it was about 86% of African Americans identified with Protestant mainline black denominations, okay? But when you move to 2014, it has dropped to below 50%. Wow. Um, and, and, and this is because a lot of African Americans now are starting to pose questions to black Christendom that in many ways, black Christendom is not ready to address. Issues of biblical literalism, classism, sexism, homophobia, the lack of desire to be involved in interface and cross interfaith and cross religious dialogues and allegiances. I'm not just talking about talking with each other. I mean, actually cross religious and interfaith relationships. Um, and so because of this decline, I think we've got to continue asking ourselves, are we being relevant? or are we being curators of black museums? Now, the reason that I'm shaping and framing this, this dialogue in this way is because I'm thinking about one of my mentors and professors, Peter Berger, who's a sociologist. Uh, <coughs> um, he wrote about the sociology of religion. I absolutely love Ber uh, Berger, his book, The Sacred Canopy. He, uh, I'm gonna use churchy language here, prophesied <laughs> that what happened with the Church of England was gonna happen in America. He said that there was gonna be a great huge um, secularizing and that just as the Church of England, which I think like in the 50s and 60s was like, I mean, it was a major force to reckon with in England, especially with this intertwined nature with power and empire and the monarch. Um, but it has become somewhat irrelevant <laughs> Uh, to the larger European society. And I'd like to think because the Church of England was tied up in this sort of cyclical and non-progressive form of talking about ecclesiology, both in its academies, Cambridge and Oxford are guilty of this as well, and also in their churches um, and with their canons. In other words, they were trying to um, doing this sort of practice this of, of apologetics or trying to substantiate its, its claim with its own history of its relevance instead of trying to make itself relevant in connection with what's happening in culture. Mm -hmm. And church historically has had a bit of a problem with this wrestling of, 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 of being in culture, but not of culture. Um, there, um, the, the, the theologian um, is, is fading my mind, maybe you can fill in here, of mm -hmm. the Christ of culture and the Christ outside of culture and Christ within culture. Churches and Christendom has often been in this battle because we're of this mindset that we're supposed to be holy and set apart. We're supposed to be separate. Um, but I, I think the work of relevance is to get in that murky cultural mess and to try and figure out where the power dynamics are in that so that the Christian work of subversion can take place. Let me give a sort of biblical example for those preachers who may be watching. We see this with Jesus and the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Now, how did they catch her unless they were also in the room with her doing the act? It's very interesting. These religious leaders come and they try to do all this stuff. Now, what they bring to Jesus is an articulation of the ancient law that they were right, she should be stoned. Um, but what Jesus does is he, he, he doesn't play this separate 
game of the religious enterprise happens with centrifugal forces outside of the human realm. Jesus jumps into the human realm. That's what the, the concept of Emmanuel is all about anyway, God coming into humanity. So I think for us as churches, especially as black churches, and I'll say mainline black churches, most of my research is on mainline denominationally affiliated black churches. Um, I'm, I'm not as convinced that a lot of our black evangelical mega churches are black churches as much as they are just filled with black persons. So I just want to make mm. that caveat, but um, because you have to be practicing a certain type of black religion and not just black religious expression, but a certain type of black religion to be characterized in my opinion as a black congregation. Mm. So the, 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 the way that black churches can remain relevant in my opinion, to go back to what I was saying is to do that work like Jesus was doing and get involved into these conversations around culture that cause us to question a lot of what we believe theologically prior to the encounter. That is what it means, in my opinion, to be relevant. And this is what brings us to the topic of issues of biblical literalism. Like, come on now, now, now how are you going to be preaching a biblical literalist message in 2020 yeah. when when, 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 when many of these texts that you're trying to use and live by literally don't even have the same implications. Prime example, let's just talk about the dynamic of divorce. It's amazing to me that the preachers who get up and still preach these texts, the Bible says you can't get a divorce. You can't be a religious leader if you've, got, if you've been gone through a divorce. And, and you have preachers who remain, women, women pastors who remain in unhealthy relationships because of this biblical literalist notion that they have to remain wedded to these persons because divorce is wrong. Now, what is the way for the black church to be relevant? Not to preach the, bib the biblical literalist notion that divorce is wrong, but to actually interrogate the text. When we see Jesus challenging this concept of divorce, you've got to understand that women don't have agency. Women don't have power. Jesus is not talking about two thinking, auditing, and independent and consensual adults who are viewed as equal in society, making a decision that it is time for them to separate for one reason or another. Jesus is specifically talking to these uh, Jewish males who because of their sexual interest in other persons will divorce one woman and marry another woman, not just making her a divorcee, but changing the very um, status of this woman in culture because after she had been divorced, after she had already um, um, been sexually involved with a particular male, it, it, it gave her no ability to have any agency, to develop wealth, to take care of herself. Many of these women were left out in the dry, but these men could prey on women for their own um, sexual interests and utilize the tricks of the Torah and Leviticus to get around it by issuing, following the instructions of Moses, a bill of divorce to her by following these particular rules. Jesus comes and says, no, no, cut that out. What he's addressing is the power dynamic that is present in the, in the situation of divorce in his context. We see this with the issue of classism. Women can't preach in church. I am just just torn to bits at the level of ignorance that I still see in a lot of our mainline black churches that are associated with the National Baptist Convention. Yes, I called it out. Who have still yet to allow women to be seen as just as much mouthpieces of God as males on the convention floor. If we get into the issue of homophobia, that becomes a whole nother level of an example of the lack of relevance. This is why we have a major exodus of over 40, uh, of, of over um, 60, 59% uh, of black millennials are leaving mainline black denominations for those very reasons. Wow. Only 41% of black millennials are interested in being a part of black churches. Now, you've got to separate that from the conversation that the Pew Research talks about Black Christianity. There are a lot of millennials mm -hmm. who relate and connect to Black religious expressions that come out of the Black church and Black Christian tradition. 
and they identify as black Christians, but their interest in being involved in the day-to-day -day experiences and upkeep of these black sacred spaces is fading drastically. And for that reason, I'm projecting that if the black church doesn't become more relevant, what the mainline black, what the mainline white church has experienced, we're getting ready to experience in a major way as soon as COVID is over with. Wow, this is a really important conversation. Thank you for kind of putting it into context because for, for this conversation, what was really significant for, for me was to kind of draw these connections between the past and the present. So the black church historically has played a major role in uh, the fight for civil rights um, and certainly as it pertains to voting rights. Obviously, we were uh, talking in the last conversation um, with uh, Jenny Castillo about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, right now, uh, what I talked with you about before we even started this, um, this uh, interview was really how today we're seeing people like Reverend um, uh, William Barber um, pick up with the uh, Poor People's Campaign. And we're also seeing people like um, uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock um, of Ebenezer Baptist Church who is uh, making his uh, run um, in the Senate. So it's a it's a really important moment uh, where we're seeing these kind of connections between what is the Black church and what is um, uh, the kind of political sphere. Um, but relevancy to that is really important. Uh, and so I wanted to ask your ask this question. Well, before you, before you say yeah. that, can I say one thing? Yeah. Um, Go for it. Um, I think one of the misnomers that we have is that black churches um, have always been uh, involved in justice work and black churches that there was a there was a heyday when black churches were all relevant. Mm. Now, my argument is that that only existed in pre reconstruction, the pre reconstruction black church is the only black church where all of the black churches were relevant. Mm. King is a bit of an exception in many ways in black mm -hmm. churches. Barber mm -hmm. is an exception in wow. black churches. Uh, during the 60s, you had a large number of black churches that did not get involved in the civil rights movement. The churches in my hometown, Rome, Georgia, they told King, don't come over here. The white folks treat us pretty good. We don't want to get involved in this. And I think this, so I just want to say, I think this issue of pushing the black church towards a place of relevance has been an ongoing issue post reconstruction. I think it's been an ongoing issue of trying to push uh, people into this realm. And it's an issue with white church. I think it's an issue with Christendom, trying to push us towards it. But I think the black church sometimes gets a lot more credit towards justice work wow. than it actually deserves um, when it comes to the, the, the actual work like with the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 um, that area. So I, I just wanted to. to, to no, say that's that. that's great. Again, this uh, this historical backdrop is very important to understanding what the challenges are today, and it, it does lead me into this next question. So, do your constituencies, uh, again, namely uh, the the church that you serve, uh, the congregation that you serve, as well as uh, your students, have to contend with voter suppression or uh, even voter apathy? Um, I would say that um, in the context of New England, the Commonwealth where I reside, that voter suppression isn't as large or as much of an issue as it is in a place like Georgia, dare I say. And Stacey Abrams' issue and Raphael Warnock and what he's been dealing with are prime examples of this. But uh, because of the um, inextricable links between uh, black people and black concerns. Uh, voter suppression that's happening in Georgia is a major issue uh, with me. Um, and it is a major concern. And voter suppression, you know, we have to be honest. It has haunted America since its founding. I'm trying to tell so many of my millennial friends that we've got to get away from this idea that voter suppression just started. Ever since the Constitution was written, some of the nation's leaders sought to deny the vote to those uh, that they didn't want to share power with. The history of voter suppression in the United States is actually the history of voting rights in this country. That's right. Um, and, you know, we even have to think about the fact that the Constitution, we, we like to go back to it, 
we have to know that the Constitution actually does not explicitly include the right to vote. Um, uh, and, and so the, 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 the original Constitution and Bill of Rights, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, it, it left the issue of voting up to individual states. Mm -hmm. now, now, this is why you have a different situation in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts versus what's happening in Atlanta and what's happening in Georgia. You have in Georgia, if you ask me, almost a modern day poll tax with this issue of having to buy stamps in order to turn in your voter card. Excuse me? You're trying to create one more hurdle. And what is this about? This is about trying to prevent the masses who could shift the power dynamic. Um, that's what voter suppression is all about. And so when I hear so many persons in my millennial constituency saying, well, there's no reason to vote because vote don't matter. Why in the, excuse, I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> but why do you think yeah. they're trying to suppress the vote if it doesn't matter? Um, so um, I just wanna say, now I'm not a lawyer, I'm a theologian and I know my lane. <laughs> But something needs to be done about the fact that voting is left up entirely to states. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is in America, states are either blue or red. Mm -hmm. And in those states where we find red, you nine times out of 10 find voter suppression. Now I'm not saying that it does not happen in blue states. I'm definitely not saying it doesn't happen in Massachusetts because I know I will get calls because I know that things are happening and we are working in certain areas, um, um, particularly immigrant communities, mm -hmm. to try and make sure that they are educated and know about the access. Um, but then you also have uh, voter suppression, which uh, morphed its way into law in the form of Jim Crow voting laws which then added all of this stuff, Clint, like these literacy tests and, yep. and uh, which made it almost uh, utterly impossible for certain persons to be able to exercise their right to vote. And so when you have voter suppression that is compounded year after year after year after year, it is then concretized in Jim Crow voting laws, and then it is, and then the right for all persons to vote is not included or undergirded by an argument in the US Constitution, you have what's going on in Georgia. Mm. So voter suppression is really real. And, and what we have to realize is that this voter suppression has led to voter apathy. There we go. Yeah. Amongst black people. Now I want to just pause here and say that one of the biggest mistakes that I think black religious leaders are doing, and uh, dare I say the baby boomers and those in our parents age bracketed up, <laughs> is they were a part of that generation that fought for the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And so they, they or, or at least their parents were, and, mm -hmm. and it's very near and dear to them. I, I know what my grandfather, he used to take me to vote with him. That's right. And he, I mean, he wasn't paying attention to what he was touching. He just went, everything was on Democrat was on the right side. He just took his hand. <laughs> All right. But he, he had a lot of pride in it. And so because of that, they're fussing at us uh, because we don't, because many millennials are not voting. But what, what we fail to realize is that what's actually happened is people are dealing with voter apathy. And, 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 and the question is, how do we fix this? How does the black church in particular address this? You can't do it by fussing and fighting. You've got to do it by subverting the narrative of apathy with direct millennial engagement. Mm -hmm. and, and my argument is that this direct millennial engagement has four components, listening, learning in community, enlightening, without fussing and educating without nagging. This becomes very important. Listening, why is listening important? Mm -hmm. We need the more senior generations to listen to the articulation of apathy, pain and anger coming from Gen Z and millennials. Sometimes people just need to be heard and to suggest that the generational trauma that that uh, we know through research exists in the great-great-grandchildren of survivors of the Holocaust 
also exists in the tensions of those of us who are descendants of slaves. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, we're dealing with generations of trauma that has been passed down to us. And the 2016 election made so many people feel like their vote didn't matter after the craze of the Obama era forced us into this colorblind concept that America had actually changed and turned from her racist ways. So listening becomes important because a lot of millennials and gen, they don't want to be talked to. Mm -hmm. They don't want to, they, listen, we understand that Rosa Parks sat down on the bus, that is important. We understand that Martin Luther King had a dream, that is important. We hear that, we understand it, but rehearsing that historical narrative is not going to inspire in us the desire. And I'm saying us, now I want, I'm going to vote, but I'm just staying in general. Yeah. Um, why that becomes important. <clears throat> now, where do we get to um, the learning part? The learning part comes in with how we fight voter suppression as a way of fixing voter apathy. We do that, number one, by fighting the weaponization of voter information, meaning that we've got to figure out how to make it easier for voters, young voters, not only to get information in a timely and convenient manner, but to share with them, because that we, we get that part, go to vote, this is where you gotta go vote, uh, this is what time you gotta be there. We don't educate on what this voting on the local level, the implications of the local level, we keep saying, well, it ain't gonna matter in November because the electoral college, excuse me, we're voting on more things than just putting Donald Trump's crazy and idiotic behind out of office. We're doing more than just that. There are a lot of things that even go on on the local level. For instance, in the state of Massachusetts, we're voting to change even the way that elections take place. And so being aware and, and, and educating, because I feel like a lot of this voter apathy around the presidential election could be subsided if we show Gen Zs and millennials how their votes on the local level can really shift things. And when you have the right people on the local levels in office and representing you on the national level from your local district, then change can really take place. The last thing I think we've got to do is we've got to educate. Mm -hmm. Educating and enlightening, th th that comes by looking at the true facts and telling our Gen Zs and millennials, you cannot get your political advice from what you scrolled past on Instagram this morning when you first woke up. Because everybody who's commentating and having dialogues um, out of anger and out of a desire to make a difference, everybody's not informed. Because the truth is, to subvert this idea that Trump would have won anyway and all this stuff around Hillary and had blacks voted in the numbers in 2016 that they did in 2012, Trump would probably not be the president. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This just came out in the LA Times article talking about voter apathy with Gen Z's and millennials. Um, the, the, the other argument that I think we've got to deal with too, and I'll stop, um, is um, uh, this, this trope that the Democratic Party ain't doing nothing for Black people. Okay, now I, I'm getting ready to go here. All right, I'm, go for it, man, I'm listening. Go here. Now, <laughs> listen, I understand that there are some major issues and problems within the DNC. But at a moment like we're in right now, where in the words of your father, where, where the world's a possible change and consistent, um, I don't know what I want to say about Trump. I want to say some explicatives, but I'm trying to remain holy, all right? <laughs> Where these worlds are colliding. At this moment, we need to think about the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Because uh, one of the things we need to realize is a lot of this troping around the Democratic Party is an RNC initiative. Mm -hmm. There are agencies and super PACs that are funding propaganda and all of this, even over social media, even over Instagram and Facebook, TikTok as well, who are trying to push this narrative against the Democratic Party because if we can't get them to vote for Trump, let's just make sure that they don't, don't vote 
for the Democratic representative. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing we've got to be very careful about is we need to stop letting people tell us about Kamala Harris's record as an AG and go and read it for ourselves mm -hmm. and actually find out the dynamics of what was happening in California during that time so that we're not incorrectly applying instances of mass incarceration that's happening in Alabama to the decisions that were being made in California. I'm not saying that some of her decisions I may have not agreed with. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm not gonna talk about those because I'm all on her team. The fly mm -hmm. let us know that Pence and Trump ain't the one. Um, but um, I think we also have to be careful about the narratives that are being spun around her. We've, we've gotta be careful that we stop allowing this question of levels of blackness. Mm -hmm. her biraciality, who she's sleeping with and who she's married to as a litmus test of her blackness. Uh, and it really depresses me when I hear queer person say, queer black person saying stuff like this, like why, why should there be a discussion of who she's married to or who she's sleeping with mm -hmm. in regards to her ability to overturn the level of injustice that we see represented in the White House right now. I think we have to be very careful around that. And I think lastly, we also have to be um, extremely careful about um, these discussions that are happening, that are being consistently brought up over and over again around Hillary and Barack Hussein Obama. Hmm. Donald Trump and the RNC's consistent focusing on those two persons when neither of them are a part of the race mm -hmm. should be proof to us that there are some distraction tactics that are being used by the GOP. Hmm. 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 Now, I, I appreciate your answer. I was really intrigued by the idea that uh, one, if something is trying is if people are actively trying to take something away from you, then it's probably important. Yeah. <laughs> and then also uh, the idea of doing your own research is really important in today's uh, day and age for sure not to just take what is being told. It's very important. We talk about it, you know, in the classroom, we talk about it at the archives uh, research center for sure, um, at the library. It's important to see the history, to connect with the history and uh, read the stuff yourself <laughs> so that you can make your own informed decision. And that's really what this is about. Uh, don't, don't let people tell you what you need to do. Go figure it out. Yes. Um, very and, important. And, 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 and I'll say that, you know, um, I love the fact that the Gen Z's and millennials are leading the resistance movement right now as it pertains to race and Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. But the only way, I'm sorry, the only way for revolt to really matter in the long run is for it to turn into policy reform. And if you don't have the right legislators in office, it makes no sense to protest if you're not going to vote because voting in people who listen will cause the protesting to become more than just reactionary. Mm -hmm. It will cause it to actually be um, um, the, the impetus behind being involved in the overall system to change it. As a queer theorist, when we're trying to subvert norms, one of the things I teach my students is, you can only queer something if you know every angle of it. The only way to turn something up on its head is to, is to be in such connection with it that, that you're able to subvert it culturally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is if you understand the parts of it and you're active and you're a part of the system itself. Now that becomes problematic in many ways. Mm -hmm. But that's what, keep, that's what prevents our, our protesting from just being reactionary. Um, I think Black Lives Matter and Gen Z and millennials, they got the in the streets revolting down pat. And they have jumped past the black church, NAACP, 100 black men, all of those um, politics of respectability, black organizations that are longstanding institutions. They jumped over them mm. to, to, to burn the damn thing down. Mm. I get that. But a lot of that group is also not being involved in voting. <laughs> And so it's like we need the black church and this new black movement with millennials and Gen Z to get together because the black church has done a very good job in trying to do souls to the polls and mobilizing in many ways across the board. Well, I want to make a turn now to uh, really the individual 
and uh, whether they're part of the Black church or whether they're part of Black Lives Matter, what have you, what can individuals do to help create a better civic society in your mind? Um, every time I would run into your father <laughs> on <the college> campus, <laughs> I would say, hello, Dr. Fluker. And he would look to me and he'd say, Brandon, are you awake? <laughs> and I would look at him and go, this Tam wearing smooth talking man is out of his mind. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would then he would end by saying, stay awake. That's right. And for me, I think the way that individuals can help to create a better society is to remain awake. Don't be sleep in November on the eve of reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Wake up. And 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 being awake. See, Dr. Fluker was telling us to be awake way before wokeness was a thing. And I like being woke. I like that idea of being woke. But but this idea of remaining awake, um, I like it because I like that phrase a lot better. Because woke tends to be a hashtag and a performance. Whereas Dr. Fluker was saying, remain awake. In other words, don't, don't just let this one instance that has incited anger in you cause you to be woke, but remain awake, meaning recognize the, the intersectionality between oppressive natures, not just, not just the ways in which things oppress and affect you, but, but look at uh, human flourishing across the board as being a part of your purpose, as a part of your calling, and as a part of your aim. Um, I'd also encourage people to uh, be proactive instead of just reactive and reactionary and responsive around issues of justice in our society. Yeah. Uh, in other words, you, you've got to address, now, now I want to turn now, I know you were talking about how individuals, but I want to stop talking black folks, I want to talk to any white people who may be looking. <laughs> Any white people that's eavesdropping in on this HBCU conversation, we need you to protest against microaggressions in the classroom, in the boardroom, in, uh, in um, city official meetings, the same way that, 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 that you were ups, uh, uh, upset about George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Um, because, 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 because what I, what I find is that the, the real way to create a civic society is, is through those small micro things in life that, that you don't really change the society to being better, uh, by just calling the name of George Floyd doing your white prayer at your white Southern Baptist or United Methodist Church mm -hmm. so that you can feel like you're relevant. You, 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 you really do that by doing the consistent work on a consistent basis and recognizing the areas of contradiction even within yourself. I, I think that that becomes important. Um, and I think it's also important for us to maintain an imagination. And this leads to a huge discussion that you and I have talked about uh, right. so much because because you can't help to create a better civic society if you can't imagine one. That's right. It, and, and so imagination becomes very important. And I believe that imagination is sparked in community because yeah. it's, it's when you're exposed to different people and different things that you then start to think. But if you only remain in your white silo, if you only stay in your black cisgender heteronormative Christocentric context, then, then that's the only worldview that you can have. And you can't think, you can't imagine outside of that. Um, so I would encourage uh, black preachers, if I could leave with the final word for yeah. the black church, I'd encourage black preachers to uh, start imagining and to encourage our congregants to imagine, to have imaginations. Many times we don't do that because we're afraid that their imagination might cause them to raise questions about our traditions that we cannot answer because we just like to regurgitate things over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, so that means that having an imagination also requires courage. 
being courageous enough to remain awake, to be proactive, and to have an imagination. Wow. I actually believe that that is the perfect space to kind of uh, let this conversation end. Because as you said, you had some final thoughts and I saw you kind of winding up the way you, the way you can. <laughs> I'm not going to hoop. I'm not gonna and winding down. That was yeah. good. That was good. No, thank you so much. Those were uh, excellent responses. Great conversation. Um, and I really think that you hit on some important ideas for, for this election cycle, for sure. And the role of Black people and the role of Black people in Black church, for sure. Um, thank you so much, uh, Reverend Dr. Proley. Thank you. Thank you, my dear friend. It is so good to see you. And uh, hello to the AUC family. I miss the AUC. I miss that. Um, it's, what is it? 830 Westview Drive? I can't believe I forgot. <laughs> I missed it's been, it's been a minute. It's been I'm a minute. sorry. I went to a good? cold mic. I was like, what's the number? Is it 830? <laughs> I want to prove that I really went to the school. You were there. Like, I can vouch for it. You were, you okay. were present. You all were right, present. all right. Yeah. I missed the AUC. I miss 830 Westview Drive and so many memories. Um, so much of the way that I think was formed because of being in that space. ITC, Morris Brown, uh, just think about so many experiences. Yes, yes. Well, when we're allowed to travel across uh, different lines again and have talks in person, uh, I will invite you uh, so that we can have this conversation again. For sure. Yes, and let me know when you're ready to come preach at my church, because I know you got a word for the Lord, from see, the Lord. See, that, that's, that's what they always say, man. I say, <laughs> say trying to work on me. See, now your congregation is going to know what the kind yes. of we used to have. <laughs> yes, yes, right. yes, yes, yes. All right, yes. man. Well, thanks. All right, friend. Take care. God bless. All right. Bye.